introduction to the Security Forum, LACNIC recognized uh, already many years ago the importance of uh, IT security, creating the Security Forum. It's a community that collaborates uh, with a mailing list uh, all year round, and we have an annual event uh, that is always done together with the LACNIC event in May. We invite speakers. Uh, this is reviewed by the Programs Committee. The Security Forum has a moderator. I am currently the moderator. This is uh, elected by the community. Last time it was in December 2014 for a two-year mandate. The tasks of uh, the moderator to modulate the mailing list, uh, usually they're not, it's not too much work and the organization of the annual event. For those of you who have not subscribed to the mailing list of the Security Forum, let me tell you that here you have the link that you can subscribe with. At present, the list has over 1,000 subscribers, most of whom are people that read, and not so many participate at least not at present. We have a very uh, brief uh, uh, website trying to g update uh, the mailing list, uh, a group of LinkedIn. If you uh, get in, in contact uh, in the event, uh, if uh, you and uh, a Twitter that uh, we don't use it much, but uh, you, we sometimes send information there. As an introduction of the event of LexSec, one of the peculiarities is that it has, it is one of the few security uh, events uh, that uh, occur in different regions as years go by. The way we, um, uh, we choose the speakers is we uh, call for uh, um, uh, people interested uh, in uh, talking about uh, certain topics that's reviewed by the programs committee then we have a keynote speaker Kathleen Moriarty will be this year's and we also have uh, invited uh, speakers and I think it was very interesting because usually all these years uh, we've had very few presentations of local uh, speakers and I think that this is one of the first years where Half of the uh, talks uh, are from local people here from uh, Peru, and I think that's good. So uh, today's event occurs in uh, two days. So since uh, 2011, we have two different blogs. We have a keynote speaker, so, and we have presentations that were assessed by the committee, and we also have uh, guest speakers. So the first part of the event is today, this afternoon, and the rest is tomorrow morning. This is the agenda for LACSEC 2015. This is today. You may see that the agenda includes topics uh, with a range uh, of different themes, not just specifically technical issues, but also auditing issues. And this is the agenda for tomorrow where we will have, contrary to what happened in previous years, we're going to have a, a panel on C search. In the four last uh, uh, LACNIC meetings, we hadn't had any. So in addition, this is the listing. For the sake of completeness, these are the members of LACSEC. <coughs> uh, these, this is the committee. The, this is people that devoted uh, their personal time uh, to assess the proposal, so we, we are very grateful to them. And then other thanks, not just uh, the Programs Committee, Carlos Ayala from Arbot Networks, that has been very uh, kind, uh, and Patricia Prandini, Patricia Prandini that also worked uh, organizing the event. So the event is open. I invite our keynote speaker, Kathleen Moriarty, 
who will uh, give a presentation. The presentation is going to in English, so make sure you have the headsets if you don't understand English. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming back from lunch early. Um, I'd like to make this a little bit interactive, and so it's a little bit hard for to see some of you in the back. Um, today's talk is on security, privacy, and the effects of ubiquitous encryption. Since many of you are operators, I'm hoping this topic is very much of interest to you, and I appreciate interaction too, and some questions uh, after the presentation. So. There's lots of motivations for increased privacy protections. Um, we saw all sorts of revelations coming out from Snowden and with that other governments, not just the United States, Bull Run and Edge Hill uh, were actually mass decryption programs. Fox Acid was targeting Tor users and to decrypt their data. Prism was a mass data collection. And you know we had radon, tra trailblazer, treasure map. Uh, just the list went on and on and on, right? So mass surveillance, and this changed the way we were thinking about attacks, right? So one of those is um, one of the attacks, and I'm, I'm not sure. I think it was radon, it was uh, splitting Ethernet and injecting packets. So we're worried about traffic interception. We're worried about our privacy, and. This changed the way that the IETF is thinking about security. We also had privacy concerns prior to this, and the IETF has done significant work on privacy and how to protect that data within protocols. How many of you are familiar with either RFC 6973 or the IAB uh, Statement on Internet Confidentiality? Anyone? Okay, great. So we have a few people. I highly recommend reading this RFC if you're at all interested in learning the important aspects of protecting at the protocol level. There's all sorts of interesting considerations like um, how do you protect data at the very base level of the data. So we're not just worried about transport encryption anymore. We're worried about object level, so that data level encryption. We're also trying to figure out, every time a document goes through the IETF, we're trying to figure out, does that piece of sensitive information need to be in this protocol? Right, so we ask that back to the protocol developers and, and have them ponder that. Um, another consideration is, instead of having a username in, could you use a role, right? Because then that obscures the um, person into a role, and it's not uh, revealing privacy information necessarily. And then we're also worried about things like indexes. Uh, I'm sure most of it le at least took some computer science classes. Hopefully, uh, most of us did. And if you think an easy example is the database index, right? So you're able to, with that index, gain access to a full record. But indexes are prevalent in all sorts of protocols. So mail is a great example where you have a mail ID and that mail ID can help you access that mail file, right? So your mail could be as simple as, Fernando, do you want to meet me for lunch? Great. I don't really care if people found that out, but, but maybe, you know, I might be discussing something personal, um, some personal event in my life, um, and, and that could be accessed. So there's many situations where you want to protect that data as well. So we're not just worried about encrypting that email, but we're also worried about how that index to access that's protected. As I mentioned before, the way we're looking at security is changing. And this was, this is quite an eye opener. And you know, in this picture, you see one single wire pointed out. And the reason for that is we've switched how we're doing encryption, what's acceptable. 
For many, many years, we were only worried about having the most secure encryption, authenticated and unbreakable encryption, right, with PKI, but we didn't get it deployed widely enough. So now we're looking to protect the masses. And because of these programs that were able to target connections, decrypt data, and gather mass amounts of data, right, these mass amounts of data into one place for analysis. So by switching the model for security to something that gets us better than clear text, but it's not unbreakable encryption, changes how folks have to um, target those, those programs. So we've moved forward with opportunistic security. And with encryption, what this means is you have an unauthenticated session. And you can negotiate encryption without authentication. Now that's breakable, just so in case you weren't aware, you can break an encrypted session that is not authenticated. And this is an important point because we're okay with this now. What this does for us is it increases the cost to gather that data and decrypt it. So this forces those monitoring to target the sessions that they want to monitor. Right, and so that's the point in this picture, is you've got to look for that one connection that you're interested in. So if there's terrorists who are using this opportunistic security that gets deployed all over the place, you can access that. But you can't do that for you know, my email to Fernando about lunch. Right, and that should be a target anyway. That shouldn't be a concern. So this is a major change for us. Um, and with opportunistic security, the goal is that you can upgrade from the unauthenticated session to an authenticated session. So maybe in a few years' time, once we've gotten opportunistic security more widely deployed, we'll increase that and have better secure connections as well from that upgrade capability. We've published some important drafts, and I just wanted to make sure that you had links to these. So if you're not as familiar with pervasive monitoring, the IETF unanimously pretty much decided the um, pervasive monitoring is an attack. And this was something we had to respond to with protocols. So we looked through every protocol document that's going through the IETF, and that's one of our considerations. And for you know, a number of years we had been adding security considerations, and for just a few years we've been adding privacy considerations. And so that's a, a nice document to look at. And if you're also interested in opportunistic security, the base document is there, but we're doing work in other working groups, like IPSec just published a draft enabling null authentication. So you can do IPSec without authentication. And there are vendors who are deploying that. And it will be turned on by default. So that's, it's interesting work that's happening. Um, and I don't think I have it on here, but there's also a group that should be starting up soon called ACME, A-C-M-E. And that's going to ease the deployment of certificates. Utah has published some really interesting drafts and um, of note, I'd say the, the ones to look at are the attacks on TLS and DTLS, and they have them all categorized so that you understand the various attacks. So if you're deploying TLS on your networks, you know how to avoid those attacks. And so that was an important draft, as well as the BCP, the best practices document for implementing and deploying TLS and DTLS. Um, it even gives you advice on which cipher suites are applicable for your environment. So other groups and things you should be aware of, and I'm curious on this one, how many folks are aware that we're looking to bake encryption into TCP? Anyone? So there's a working group called TCP. OK, so one person. Um, this, so this is a really important point and something you should be aware of, that we have a working group set up focused on figuring out, can we encrypt at the TCP level? So, you know, this response to the relevations is, 
really changing how we do things. So TCP being encrypted is going to shift things. Um, how many people in the room are worried about DNS privacy? So if you're going to, okay, so we have at least a couple of people concerned. Um, okay, uh, and those not concerned, maybe you should be. So the problem with DNS privacy is you do your lookups, and if you think about it, the host names and domain names are often quite revealing, right, in terms of what you're doing. And maybe it's not important for you, but maybe it's important for a family member who's in some sort of situation, and they want to use the internet for research, but they don't want somebody to know what they're researching. Maybe they're having some life event change, and they want to learn a little bit more. So the DNS privacy effort is, aimed at reducing the exposure of sensitive names in DNS to protect the privacy of the person doing those searches. Okay, so now I'm gonna shift gears and I'm wondering how many people are network operators in the room? Okay, so we have a few. And how about security operators? Okay, so a few of those as well. Um, when we started all of this work, I started to get concerned about the impact of encryption on the internet. And not because I don't think it's a good idea, because I do think we should be taking these, these steps, and I do think that encrypting data, protecting the security of sessions, and your privacy is important. But what we're seeing happen is um, some effects of that ubiquitous encryption as operators are adjusting to this new world. Um, so this means some of the functions you're performing today or yesterday you can't perform anymore or you won't be able to soon. And you'll have to come up with new methods and in some cases you won't be able to replicate the functionality. And so what uh, I started and I'm working with uh, co-editor Al Morton on is a draft called The Effects of Ubiquitous Encryption, and we're looking for your contributions. And I'll go through some examples of what we have in this draft and why this is important. But basically, this draft is meant to be very neutral. We're collecting the types of functions that you're performing, the goal of those functions, and um, documenting them in one place so that if your functions are now impeded, perhaps understanding those goals will help you take the next step to uh, solving the problem. So maybe I write down one of the problems and um, Graciela comes up with a solution. <laughs> um, and, and that's the goal. And this draft, you know, your contributions, you just keep it very factual. We're getting contributions from lots of service providers around the world, including mobile providers. And so I'd like to make sure your perspective is captured in this as well. So what's the problem? Why are we so worried about this? Well, the response from some service providers has been to try to stop the encryption negotiation. How many of you heard about the service provider, and this was in the US, so I don't know if you, you have heard about this, um, who was stopping start TLS negotiations so that they could inject ads into their mail for end users? Okay, so a few people heard of that. Now, that was stopped. Media exposure helped to stop that, and regulators helped to stop that. But if we document these problems and we expose this, then maybe better solutions can come out of it and then other operators will realize the right response is not to um, try to stop the encryption. So now I'm gonna run through some of the areas we're covering in the draft. And um, in the draft, there's lots of blank space and that's meant for your contributions, just so you understand that when you take a look at the draft. So one of the big concerns is middle box monitoring. And this, of course, gets a lot tougher with encrypted traffic. So traffic analysis fingerprinting. Um, how many of you do traffic analysis fingerprinting? 
Okay, so maybe this isn't a big concern for the folks in this room. Um, it can be done both on encrypted and clear text data, and basically the fingerprint is for pattern matching. Of course, your data is going to be a lot more rich if you're able to pattern match on clear text data because you can get more data out of this, whereas the encrypted, you might only be able to see some header information, um, maybe the IP addresses, source destination, ports, and protocols. Your accuracy is going to go down with encryption, but it's still possible. And then on the flip side, you also have uh, the web traffic, which when you do the fingerprinting, you run into privacy problems. So that is a concern, and the use of encryption will help prevent that particular problem. So there's multiple ways to look at these efforts of middle box monitoring. Traffic survey is an, another interesting one, and this is where you're doing observations over time. And any of you who are running operations, I'm sure you're doing some sort of traffic surveys because this alerts you to security problems, bandwidth problems, any other kind of fluctuation that's happening on your network because you have that trending information. Now, once you encrypt this, your observations, you know, the amount of data going into your observations is reduced. And that could be problematic because now the accuracy is, has gone down. Uh, another example is deep packet inspection. And here, you know, you're analyzing flows of uh, user flows and applications. This has gone down a bit, at least for um, content distribution networks. And that's a good thing because we don't have to worry about uh, the interception of traffic for those points and breaking the encryption. Uh, the reason why it's going down for content distribution networks is that the providers of the data want more control over it. So they're shifting these models where the user has to come directly to them to access the content. And it's really a control mechanism. Um, so that's helping with the middle box problem. And then the last one is data compression gateway. Uh, and this is a case where you're minimizing the traffic required. And this might be for a resource constrained mobile device or something along those lines. So the next area is performance management and troubleshooting. And the general theme is for operators, as we move towards encrypted traffic, you have less visibility into uh, monitoring flows of data on the internet. So your performance and availability mo monitoring might be impacted. And you're going to have to figure out other ways to achieve these functions. Um, you know, in some sense, you should be able to do those observations on the encrypted traffic and still see the capacity, availability, performance, but over encrypted traffic. Uh, the problems you might run into would be some accuracy, right? You might not be able to discern if the traffic was web traffic versus something else. Um, and the reason might be that you don't see the ports, right? So if you're using IPsec tunnel mode, you've hidden that it's TCP port 443 or that it's um, SMTP port 25. And so you can't assess if it's a service problem or um, you know, on the server side, or it might be something in the middle of the network. So dealing with these problems will get a bit more difficult, and some creativity may be necessary to figure out how we do this troubleshooting in this new space. WebSockets also makes the application differentiation more difficult. Um, some of the other problems in so I'm not sure this one is, is such a problem, and I'd like to hear from, from you guys once we open up to questions, but encryption in hosted SP environments, service provider environments. This, I believe, the push has been going on for much longer. And I think there's a lot of motivation on the service provider end to provide more secure services for their customers. Uh, I've been seeing this for quite a while in a role as a consultant in the past, and also advising some large companies and, and working with some service providers. And then also looking at trending data of what service providers are doing. And the reason for this is that 
You know, we started out with the hosting services and a big push towards things like Amazon, where, you know, if you're going to store, use, you know, AWS in the past, you would not have put secure data out there. It might have been a test environment or something along those lines. But there's a shift now. And the service providers are responding by providing more secure options in their cloud environments. And um, this means that you as customers or you as a provider are negotiating contracts and embedding encryption in, transport encryption, data level encryption, tight access management controls, and then having this uh, in agreements that are checked annually or even maybe more frequently. So here you might have to shift already to models where you're using logs for monitoring instead of uh, being able to observe traffic because of the level of encryption. And that monitoring, I, I think I mentioned this already, might be down to either a two-tuple or a five-tuple. And the two-tuple would happen in the case of the use of IPsec tunnel mode, where you just have the IP address of the source and destination. And then the five-tuple, if you're using something like TLS, on your session, because that also gives you access to see at the application level um, the source and destination IP, the ports, and the protocol, because it's an application level encryption. Uh, data storage. So here, this is interesting because uh, data storage is outsourced. And, you know, I mentioned the AWS example, but Lots of service providers have very large storage offerings, and this is a major um, hosted solution. Um, and here, the needs vary. I'd say if you're doing anything sensitive, what you really want is the host level encryption, which by that term, what I mean is you're encrypting data at the application that's either creating or storing that data, or creating that data to be stored um, or accessing that data. And so you might be doing that in your, your environment, and then when you push something out to be stored, it's encrypted before it leaves your desktop or before it leaves the server on your site, so before it hits any kind of storage mechanism. And the types of encryption they have even let you split the data. So let's say you have a huge data file and you can fill your local storage, but then you have to burst out to another type of storage that might be hosted. Um, the solutions that we have today actually allow that to happen. And so it, you know, there's some interesting developments in that space. And then there may even be just record level encryption and more traditional solutions that you, you would have been used to in other environments. Um, then we have disk encryption or data at rest. And this is interesting because sometimes it's just used where you push this data out to the storage device um, and it's done locally. So either controller based or SED based encryption right on the drive. And you might not even encrypt the wire that it's sent on. And the reason is that accessing that data is very easy. You're able to do it through the approved applications and equipment that can touch that data. But if I pull that disk out of the server, it's useless. And that's useful in, like, let's say an embassy is getting attacked. You can delete the key, you're done, don't have to worry about that data, you can even leave it behind, but it's useless without the applications that can tap on it. Um, but if you have secure data, you're going to also encrypt that session. And then data replication between data centers. There was a big increase in this as a result of the Snowden rel uh, revelations as well. Like you saw the big service providers, uh, Google, Yahoo, and others, and probably some in Latin America, started to encrypt their data center to data center connections as a result of that. So um, is that something that you saw happen in Latin America as well, in South America? Anyone? No? Okay, so the, okay, so a little bit. Um, so, you know, that was a, a, an important push that is showing, you know, the increase of encryption. 
So now, one of the other areas that's really going to be hugely impacted is how we monitor for incidents. In some cases, I think the impact is going to be bigger than others. So I'm just going to walk through a few examples. And uh, the draft goes into some of the examples. But I know some of you are on the ground doing incident response. So I'd love to get more examples into the draft. So let's say we have a phishing attack come into an, an environment. And the user goes out to a website and they wind up getting infected with some sort of problem. Well, your security people are going to take a look at that incident, and they're going to grab certain pieces of information out of it. Uh, that URL that brought them to the malicious site that allowed them to download data is one of those critical pieces of information. And as an administrator, if this came into your network, either your user is going to alert you to this, or maybe your web logs if that email was encrypted. So you will be able to get that, but maybe it's not in the email if the email is encrypted. Maybe it's through the web logs, and then seeing that you have an infected computer. And that's a bit problematic to take care of it that late in the game after you've had an infection. Um, other sources of data in it might be the server that that email came in from, from the, the folks perpetrating this attack that could have been targeted on your user. And um, if that's obscured on the mail server, which right now it's not, right? Right now we have encryption on the session. And when you're doing encryption on, on a mail message, if you're using SMIME or PGP, it's typically just on the body. But if there's a shift with some of the end-to-end -end email efforts, we may even have to worry about being able to do searches on the email to protect our data, or uh, to protect our users, rather. Um, now, none of those proposals have gone through, but that's some of the discussion happening. And so as incident responders and folks concerned about the security of your networks, that's something I'd really like you to think about. Um, you know, maybe there's a limit to what we can encrypt or not encrypt. And I think that's something that's very important for you to ponder and help us come to good conclusions in the IETF as, as those types of proposals move forward. So what might happen from this particular attack is, let's say, data is exfiltrated out of the network. Now, we're already seeing that type of data being encrypted, right? So anyone doing incident response sees the data encrypted, and um, you're able to detect that because you might be going to new destinations in the network. Um, the bursts of traffic may fit a different pattern than you're used to, even though it's encrypted. So there are ways that we've come to figure out how to do that level of monitoring. And it was an adaption when that increased encryption happened. So another case is fraud. And fraud's kind of interesting. Um, it's a separate category on its own. And there aren't that many people that are experts in fraud analysis and investigations. Um, they do interesting things like sit in chat rooms and look for credit card numbers being shared or, or bought and sold. And they look for account numbers from banks being bought and sold um, and capture that data. And when there's a service involved, you know, they provide that back to the particular bank that may have had their financial information exposed so that the bank could remedy that on behalf of their users. Um, all of those chat rooms are encrypted. So that's a matter of somebody being able to get into that space, right? And so that may not be as impacted, um, but it remains to be seen. So there could be some new challenges that come up in that space. And then denial of service attack, well, you know, in that case, you're looking for patterns of data. And the patterns could include encrypted data or not. And so I don't think that there'll be a huge impact on doing fingerprinting for denial of service or other methods of detection. But it may change things a little bit. All right, so in summary, uh, we're only going to see encryption increase. 
and we'll have this phase where we have the opportunistic security, where we have unauthenticated sessions that are breakable, and perhaps in the future, the upgrades to fully authenticated um, and less breakable, I won't say unbreakable, sessions could result. Uh, we are very concerned about protecting users' privacy and hope that you are as well and hope that you are you know, uh, helping us to improve the security and privacy for all of our users on the internet since you guys have the ability to make those changes. Um, and current techniques might change, so I'd love your help and contributions to the SAG list, S-A-A-G, at the IETF on other methods we have, may have missed uh, for your current monitoring that might be impacted. And so I think this is an important work because after that we'll be able to innovate on top of that. Or maybe you can innovate on what somebody else has posted to help them with their problems. So with that, I'd like to see if there is any questions. Si alguno tiene preguntas, por favor, acérquese a los micrófonos, eh, anuncie su nombre, si tiene afiliación, y si, prosiga con la pregunta. My name is Pablo Kellis from the Dominican Republic. Okay, I support uh, the use of end-to-end -end encryption as much as possible. However, I'm thinking about the corporate environment where we have to control the internet access by the employees. In the past, it was not as difficult to make, uh, to, to establish such controls because we looked at the, the headers, uh, not only source and destination IP addresses, not only source and destination TCP or UDP ports. It was relatively easy. Okay, then things started changing. Many services were moved to web, I mean TCP 80, and we had to, to access the packet at a deeper level. We had to look at level seven information, and we have to read what the packet had inside in the payload data uh, section. Next, we have more encryption. Then we have a problem there. We cannot read what the packet has inside, unless, in some cases, we have a proxy server inside the company that, that is acting, uh, well, not, not a man-in-the-middle attack, but it, it, uh, is, yeah. it, it is something like that because it is someone who is in the middle of an encrypted communication. The users are not always aware of that. But my question is, uh, how much will be the impact of a higher use of encryption when we have to take into consideration that in the corporate environment, we have to control user access to the internet. So you're in a unique position in a corporate environment because your lawyers have set up employee agreements with people. And so I'm not speaking as a security area director of the IETF right now, just to, and, and the whole talk wasn't, to, just to make that clear as I respond on, on this particular question. But when your employees sign that agreement, they are saying they are subject to monitoring. You can monitor them on their desktop. You can monitor them at a proxy before they leave your network. And they should, they should be made aware that this is happening with their traffic. So I know within the corporate environment I work, if I go through um, our proxy firewall, I believe we do uh, intercept certain connections, but not all. Right, so it's up to the company to set a reasonable policy. So where I work, they made a decision to not intercept financial transactions. Right, so that's privacy information. Um, for us, many of those financial companies are, are partners or, um, you know, we do business with them. They're customers as well. And so we don't intercept those. But other things, social media, that might be fair game because you could be exfiltrating data out of the company to your Facebook account because there's an HTTPS session on it and you think you're protected. Um, 
you know, there should be a, a notice, at least initially, I think for most firewalls you do get an error that you're negotiating and the certificate doesn't match the end host. Okay. Um, but it's, it's up to you to make that aware to your users. And we do have a section in the draft for enterprise, but I haven't started filling that out yet. And I've been in your shoes, um, but if we don't get that, if you want to contribute text on those problems, We'd love to add that and have more contributors you know, to this draft because it shows um, the concerns, right, and that we, we need to find solutions. Or in some cases, this, is, this might be okay from a corporate environment and that, you know, that might be fine. And I'm not aware of anything right now that would prevent that two sessions. So the difference with this kind of mad in the middle is that as an end user, you're having your TLS session um, negotiated with this middle box, this proxy server, before you leave the network. And then you have some clear text access, and then the, there's another TLS session that's negotiated from that proxy to the server, right? So you have two separate sessions, and that's a little different than some of the attacks on the TLS protocol that um, give you access to it. Like uh, some of the attacks actually involved using the key that were negotiated. And so that's a whole different scenario. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, this is Felipe Trabaldos from Cloudflare. And similar to what he was saying, more on the service provider level, a lot of ISPs used to have different caching equipment, which were essentially proxies, as a lot of this traffic moves to fully encrypted from a lot of the internet companies, it's not really possible to do that. Is there anything in the standards committee work to kind of try and find a balance for certain things on the service provider level to be able to optimize, you know, cat videos versus personal BII communication or, or well, things that, that, that really do deserve privacy versus other things that can be used from a network optimization perspective? So we didn't get specific enough on that in this draft, but I would welcome your assistance on that. Um, you know, in the U.S., we just had all of the, um, um, the term is slipping my mind, um, net neutrality, mm -hmm. right? And that term got mixed up, I think, by the legal folks and policy folks, and they didn't quite understand the difference between monitoring traffic and um, the ability to just manage it, right, and prioritize certain sessions as opposed to like preventing a user from going to a different service provider. And I think that just kind of got uh, stuck together. Now, in terms of the IETF, um, since I'm in the security area, I'm not as familiar with other work until it comes to final publication and then I read it. Um, there has to, there, I mean, we've done tons of work in traffic management. When it moves to encryption, most folks so far are using TLS, right? And so with TLS, you can decipher to some extent, except for the problem where a lot of the traffic is over the web now, right? So if it's using 443, it is harder to differentiate it. Um, you know, if it's tunneled in there, yeah, cat videos versus watching streaming LACNIC, Right, it's not even. Right, <laughs> right. And, and we would hope that streaming LACNIC would be prioritized a bit higher than the cat videos, but that's why we all do this, right, for cat videos? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> all right, thank you. Um, question of mine. Uh, you mentioned in your slide, in, during your presentation that there was an effort to um, incorporate encryption in TCP. Is that something related with what used to be TCP crypt at the time? That's one of the four proposals that went into uh, the working group. And what's the motivation for doing that at the transport layer as opposed to a uh, higher layer? What's yes. the motivation? What's the motivation for that? Yeah, just baking it in at the transport layer. Um, and there's been folks talking about getting encryption in even at a link layer, but I don't see that pushing forward anytime soon. Okay. Yeah, so this is all about privacy and protecting users. Um, but we do need to 
get all of these challenges documented so that we can come up with solutions to the problems that you're all encountering. So I'd really uh, appreciate help with that. ¿Alguna pregunta más? Bueno, pido un aplauso entonces para Kathleen. Thank you, Fernando, and thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you. Appreciate this very much. Eh, invito a nuestro... I now invite the next speaker. The next speaker is Javier Romero, and he will speak about incidence response techniques.